1900, there were some half dozen major wheel makers who turned out more than 500,000 wheels per year for a young nation more mobile than any the world had yet seen. One of those companies began in 1867 to join with others in providing wheels for everything from coal wagons to omnibuses, from elegant Surreys, Victorias, and Bromes to the lumbering prairie schooners that cut wheel ruts all the way to the Pacific. Today, this company is the only one of the major wheel manufacturers still in existence. Hoops, Brother, and Darlington of West Chester, Pennsylvania. This factory is neither a reconstruction nor a restoration, but a rare surviving relic of a major 19th century industry. It still is making wheels, much the same way as it did in 1900, although not surprisingly, its output now is less than one-tenth of its production in that year. About 12,000 wheels are produced each year by Hoops, Brother, and Darlington, and they're six months behind in their orders. Their customers range from manufacturers of street-cleaning push wagons to movie production companies. And the local Amish and Mennonite population still insist that the wooden wheel is the best way to get around. But the great bulk of their product is for decorative purposes. Hoops, no doubt, could sell twice as many as they now make, except for one major problem, the lack of skilled hands. In his heyday, Hoops employed more than 175 men. Today, there are fewer than 20. And when these men die, so too will die one of the prime skills that contributed to the rapid development of the United States. We are fortunate to be able to see the last vestige of these men and their machines before they exist no more. Throughout the world, almost every kind of native wood has been used to make wheels. But in America, there was hickory, a wood so strong and pliable that a lighter product of equal strength could be made, an important consideration in transportation. Today, as when the company began, logs are taken from local sources. When Hoops was at its height, the railroads brought lumber from the great forests of the south and west to supply the need. Today, the company does not require a full-time sawyer. The part-time sawyer is a janitor at a local college. The wheel manufacturing process begins with the sawing of the rough logs into slabs, which are later sawn into smaller elements. The first boards cut are called flitches. 
These are then cut into two-inch squares from which will be formed the spokes and rim sections of the wheels. The rim sections are called fellows in the industry. This worker is marking the first fellow prior to attaching it to the spokes. Beside these two parts, the wheel also includes a hub, and inside the hub, the bearing. And finally, when all the fellows are on, the wheel will receive an outer wearing tread, or tire. In order to make the fellows semicircular, they must be steamed to make them pliable enough to bend. This is done in a steam vessel, or autoclave, where the squares remain for several hours. The next process must be done quickly before the heat and moisture escapes from the wood. Hoops has two wood bending machines. This one, used in making small wheels, probably was built in their own shops. It's unusual in that a man must apply upward pressure to the bed of the machine to keep the squares pressed tightly against the form, preventing splintering. Four or five fellows are bent at once, and their ends tied. They are then sent to the drying room, from which they will emerge permanently bent. A more common type of bending machine was the commercial wing type, in which the bed itself raised up to bend the wood around the form. This machine also was called upon to produce bent wood chairs, sleigh runners, and plow handles. When the fellows have spent some 72 hours in the drying room, they're dressed to the proper thickness and beveled so that the inside edge is narrower than the edge that will face the ground. The fellow is then sanded, making it ready to be placed on the wheel when that time comes. Unlike the earlier wheelwrights who single-handedly crafted their products from the start to finish, Hoops employed a mass production system with over 200 men in which each performed a specialized task. Spokes begin as the fellows do, but they are sent to the drying room directly after sawing and are then turned on irregularly turning lathes. This one was designed and built by hoops. What emerges from the lathe is a rough surfaced spoke, elliptical in cross section, left square on one end. That square end will be the part facing the center of the wheel, fixed to the hub, but only after it's further machined into a rectangular tongue or tenon that will be driven into the hub. Finally, the spoke is sanded or polished. To 
the central core of the wheel is the hub. On its strength rests the strength of the entire wheel. The hub is a shaped cylinder of wood, usually oak, with a hole bored through its axis to receive the metal bearing. The rectangular holes around the outside are mortises, which receive the tenons of the spokes. Hubs begin as small trees, which are cut into lengths of about one foot. They are then bored lengthwise, which at this stage serves also to help in the drying of the log. After the hubs are bored, they're debarked on a lathe. This one once was used in the manufacture of wooden automobile wheels, a line which continued to support the industry for a short time after the demise of horse-drawn vehicles. After debarking, the hub is seasoned for a month or more, depending on its size. It is then turned to the proper shape. At Hoops, there still exists an automatic lathe for this purpose, but the skilled hands needed to set the machine up no longer are here, so the chore is performed on a simple, manual wood-turning lathe. The hub then receives a series of metal bands which are pressed on to strengthen it and keep it from cracking. As you recall, the spoke ends are rectangular, and so the hub must have a series of rectangular holes to receive the spokes. First, a regular series of round holes is drilled into the hub. These are then made rectangular by a reciprocating chisel or mortiser. These holes are called mortises. All the parts of the wheel have now been manufactured and are ready to be fitted together. First, the spokes are pounded into the hub. On lighter wheels, this is done with a mallet. On heavier ones, a pneumatic hammer is used. For obvious reasons, the hub and spoke assembly is called a spider. The spokes are then trimmed to a uniform length and their outer ends machined into tenons. In this case, the tenons are round and will fit into the hole previously drilled into the fellow. One rectangular mortise and tenon joint is all that's needed to keep the spoke from rotating in the finished wheel. The fellows are fitted to the spider on the rimming machine. Mechanical pressure is applied to bring the two together, and when the process is finished, the wheel is essentially formed. Next, the outer tread is sanded, and so too are the sides of the rim. Although it would be possible to fit the wheel to a vehicle at this point, the hub and tread surfaces soon would wear, and the wheel would have to be replaced. Indeed, this was just the case with the earliest wheels, until such practices as driving large-headed nails into the outer rim were devised to prolong the life of the wheel. But it was not until the 19th century that the one-piece iron or steel hoop tire was developed. It has remained the most commonly used tire on these wheels since then. The hoop tire is measured from steel flat stock by rolling the wheel one revolution along it. Only the expert eye knows how much extra to allow for shrinkage in the welding process. The measured and cut stock is then fed through a bending machine to make it circular and then the tire is sent out to be welded at a local shop. The welding forges at Hoops, Brother and Darlington have been silent for some time now. Another series of skills that have been lost.
when the welded tires return, they're slipped over their respective wheels. If the fit is tight, the workman resorts to the hammer. The next step is to permanently bond the tire to the wheel in a hydraulic upsetting machine. This machine compresses the tire uniformly from all directions. The workman removes the wheel from the machine and bounces it on the floor. His ear will tell him if the fit is tight or whether a return trip to the upsetting machine is necessary. The final process is the fitting of the steel inner bearing into the hub. The first hole drilled into the hub is enlarged to receive the bearing sleeve, commonly called the box. The box is pressed hydraulically into the hub and the wheel is finished. In the heyday of hoops, the wheels were painted as a final step, but a paint shop no longer is kept up, and so the wheels are shipped to the customers unpainted. It has been said that while fire is man's greatest discovery, the wheel is his greatest invention. <laughs>